Our first speaker is Don Bradley. Don Bradley is a writer, editor, and researcher specializing in early morning history. Don recently performed an internship with the Joseph Smith Papers Project and is completing his thesis on the earliest Mormon conceptions of the New Jerusalem toward an MA in history in Utah State University. He has published on the translation of the Book of Mormon, Plural Marriage Before Nauvoo, and Joseph Smith's Great Fundamental Principles of Mormonism and plans to publish an extensive analysis co-authored with Mark Ash Ashurst McGee on the Kinderhook Plates. Don's first book was The Lost 116 Pages, Reconstructing the Missing Contents of the Book of Mormon. At this time, we'd like to introduce Don Bradley. Who's Hello, everyone. Um, for those of you who saw my um, dramatic entrance uh, five minutes before the appointed speaking time, I promise that the presentation itself will be similarly dramatic. Um, on a family trip to upstate New York when I was a kid, we visited the sacred grove. As we were leaving, I saw on the edge of the grove two personages handing out literature. You were probably picturing these personages like this, oh, whoops, like, ah, pictures missing, dang it, like the pictures of the first vision that you've seen, but actually this would be more close to the reality of it, and it would even be more accurate to picture them like this, because um, these people were, in fact, Raelians. They were members of a UFO religion, and their tracts that they were handing out argued that the first vision was Joseph Smith being visited by extraterrestrials. And I'm getting a phone call on this thing. <laughs> Sorry. Um, This, uh, by the way, is actually a true story. Um, my mom remembered that incident better than I did because I was only about 11 years old. Um, but I am not really sure if it was uh, one personage or two in the experience, uh, so my accounts of it may vary over time. Um, much has been written on the first vision, and uh, so much, in fact, that one might wonder how much more could there be to be said on the subject. I can promise you that there's quite a bit. And I think, in fact, that um, after nearly two centuries, we're just beginning to understand what happened that spring morning. And what its implications are for under our understanding of the gospel and for our lives. Um, so. Around the year 2000, I started wrestling deeply with my religious belief. I had a faith crisis uh, even before it was cool. Um, and um, on Pioneer Day 2005, uh, I hand-delivered a letter resigning my membership from the church to my bishop. Um, I did not, at the time, believe anymore, and I didn't think that I had anything to offer to the church. Um, among the things that I didn't believe in was the first vision. I thought the first vision existed only as a narrative, not as an actual event. And in short, I believed that Joseph Smith had made it up. Um, I also, at that time, after I met with the bishop, I met with my stake president. And one of the last things that the stake president said to me as I was leaving is that he had a feeling that I would be back, that I would return to the church. I knew I wasn't coming back, right? Um, but um, I didn't want this nice man to feel any worse than he had to in the situation. And so um, I decided, I did this quick mental um, analysis of the situation, and I remembered that Blake Osler had taught me in my uh, intro to philosophy class at the BYU Salt Lake Center that um, if something wasn't inherently contradictory, like a married bachelor, it was logically possible. So I said, with that thought in mind, it's possible. And um, 
I thought it was just absolutely never going to actually happen, though. Uh, while I was outside the church, I continued avidly digging into church history, I just was fascinated with understanding what happened, including understanding the first vision. So although I then believed that the first vision only existed as a narrative, I thought that it was a narrative that was worth exploring. I wanted to understand what the original first vision, meaning for me the original narrative that Joseph Smith had told was, and what its significance was. That is, what function the narrative filled. In spring 2010, nearly five years after leaving the church, I began writing a new paper. In that paper, I theorized that the first vision was the origin story behind Joseph Smith's role as a seer, that it was the event from which he was supposed to have derived his gift of seeing. In the early days of May of that year, I was sitting in the library cafe at Utah State University, and I wrote and worked more on my ideas for this paper. Um, dots started to connect in ways that I couldn't have guessed. I feverishly recorded a bunch of new ideas, realizing that the first vision was an endowment, that it was a revelation of staggering expansiveness, and that it was an actualization of some of the most powerful doctrines of the restoration. Going into that writing session in the library, I had had absolutely no intention of returning to the church, didn't believe that was even possible for me, and I was actually happily serving as one of the leaders of the local uh, Baha'i community. I'd become a Baha'i um, at that time. Uh, so while it would take much more soul-searching, reflection, on my own spiritual experiences and personal work before I was ready to return to the church, by the time that writing session in the library ended, I was penetrated by one of the most startling realizations of my life, I am going back to the church. Up until the very moment that this happened, the idea that this research would lead me back to the church and to be standing here presenting that very research at the fair conference is something I could only have understood at the time as a joke. I can easily imagine saying something to fellow ex-Mormon friends, and I have a particular friend in mind at the time, who is actually no longer ex-Mormon. Um, before this turning point, I can imagine saying to her uh, something about someday presenting my research at the fair conference, but at that time, I can only imagine saying it as a joke and a riotously funny one at that. Um, so what, what in the heck happened? <laughs> uh, how did I end up here? Uh, well, in, in proof that God has a rich sense of humor, here I am, and um, I will tell you how I ended up here. So the thesis of what I have to say today to you is that the first vision was an endowment and an enactment of the gospel of Jesus Christ. What I started to see that day at the USU library, uh, but that took a while to fully dawn on me in all its implications, is that yes, the first vision was Joseph Smith's calling as a seer, as I had been hypothesizing, but it was also more than that. It was also his, if you will, initiation as a seer and that this initiation was a kind of endowment anticipating the temple ritual that the prophet started to reveal to others in Nauvoo. I started to see that Joseph Smith's first vision endowment also prefigured what we tend to think of as Nauvoo doctrine, particularly the doctrine of exaltation. And most importantly, my eyes began to be open to see that the foundational event of the restoration, Joseph Smith's first vision, was an encapsulation and potent demonstration of the gospel of Jesus Christ. We may be inclined to think of Joseph Smith's first vision as only a revelation about the restoration of the church, right? He's told uh, the true church isn't on the earth, but it's coming. Uh, this is how we, this is not inaccurate, but this is mostly how we talk about the first vision. Uh, what I want to submit to you today is that the first vision was so much more than that. More than a revelation about the restoration of the church and the gospel, 
The first vision was also a revelation of the gospel, an encapsulation of the entire plan of redemption and a manifestation of the redeeming power of Christ. It is, in fact, the spiritual experience that most completely sums up the gospel and the most powerful manifestation of the redeeming power of Christ that I, as a historian of religion, have ever encountered. The first vision was an endowment. So what do I mean by this? Um, so first, the first vision, I will be going through each of these things. First vision was esoteric. I'll talk about what I meant, mean by that. First vision was an initiation, involved the, the blessing, touching of Joseph's eyes. First vision involved a lifting up, or what that term means, also exaltation. The first vision led to the recovery of Joseph's white stone, his first seer stone, an object that is linked in scripture with receiving a new name. And the first vision began Joseph Smith's process of acquiring divine attributes, that is, of becoming like God. So let's start with the first vision being esoteric. What do I mean by that? So by esoteric here, I mean that it involved higher levels of truth that are withheld until people are prepared for them. So Justice Smith doesn't just walk out of the grove and tell people, here's everything that I experienced. Here's everything I learned. Uh, so how do, we, how do we know that? Uh, so a couple things. One, that, one thing that hints in that direction, and there's something more direct than this, but first, the first vision parallels Christ's transfiguration on the Mount of Transfiguration. The words, the familiar words of the first vision, this is my beloved son, hear him, are actually those spoken by God the Father to Peter, James, and John at the Mount of Transfiguration in Matthew 17. So there's a, there's a kind of biblical echo in what the Father says at the beginning of the first vision. That transfiguration experience was itself esoteric. Peter, James, and John were told by Jesus to keep it secret. When they came down from the mountain, Jesus charged them saying, S -s -s tell no man, tell the vision to no man until the Son of Man be risen again from the dead. Joseph Smith actually kept his own first vision esoteric, and he actually tells us this, although we kind of have to have eyes to see, right, what he's telling us. Uh, he, he kept it esoteric from the start. So Joseph tells that after the vision, when he was weak, weak, physically weak after the experience, he went home. As I leaned up to the fireplace, mother inquired what the matter was. I replied, never mind, all is well. I am well enough off. I then said to mother, I have learned for myself that Presbyterianism is not true. Full stop. I, you just saw God. <laughs> And all you say to mom is, you know that church you're going to? Mm-mm, it's not right. That was all that, that was what was relevant to her at that time. So from the very moment he comes out of the grove, the first time he talks to someone else about the first vision, he holds back 99.99% of what that experience was and just gives out the part that is immediately relevant. So it's easy for us to look at that and think, ah, that's all she found out at that time, but, but we know, we know the, the whole story. What I'm going to submit is, no, we don't, that Joseph Smith was always doing the same thing that he did with, with his mother, with all the audiences he talked to. To varying degrees, he was withholding things based on how prepared his audience was and what their needs were. But if Joseph only told elements of the first vision to others as they were ready for them, then it's significant to note that the familiar published accounts of the first vision were all either written for general publication or recorded as Joseph narrated them to a non-Latter-day Saint audience. So in other words, the accounts of the first vision that we have, the familiar accounts, were given precisely in context directed to audiences where we would expect Joseph to have held back much of the experience. In context of faith, where Joseph was relating his experience to the saints rather than to the non-Latter-day Saint public, 
we would expect him to have disclosed additional details. Fortunately, there are times when Joseph told the vision to a Latter-day Saint audience rather than to outsiders, and the first, one of these is not actually a first chronologically, the first we'll talk about. It's 1844, Alexander Niebauer's journal. In that account, Joseph does give details that are not in his published accounts. He talks more about Christ's appearance, and he talks a little bit specifically about Christ's robe in ways that would be interesting for Latter-day Saints who have been through the temple, but would not be relevant or maybe not appropriate to talk about to just the general public. Um, another account that we will be discussing further is one given in Kirtland at the home of Joseph Smith Sr. and reported by John Auger. And then another is a sermon Joseph gave in Nauvoo, June 11, 1843. The first vision was also Joseph's initiation into seership. So this was the idea I had started working on for this paper. So think about it. We call it Joseph's first vision. Uh, he referred to it at one time as uh, by um, the words like first vision of angels, something like that. Um, so if it's his first vision, if a vision is an experience of seeing things that are not visible to the natural eye, seeing with spiritual eyes, then the first vision is Joseph's first experience of second sight. It's the first time he's acting as a seer. Um, it's also reported, and we'll talk about this presently, um, by John Auger, that uh, the first vision actually involved the touching of Joseph's eyes so that he could see spiritual things. Again, part of an initiation. Uh, and this vision led to the finding of his first seer stone, which we'll also discuss further. Um, I'm seeing that time is actually already flying by, so I will just quote or summarize here a little bit. So this account is from uh, much later. It's from the early 1890s. I'll talk in a minute about why I would argue that it's trustworthy. This is from John Auger. John Auger is the brother of the uh, famous uh, Fanny Auger, or as we generally mispronounce her name, Fanny Alger, um, who lived with the Smiths for some time. Um, and when John Auger was in uh, Kirtland at the Joseph Smith Senior Home at one time, he heard Joseph Jr. relate the first vision and Joseph said that the father touched his eyes, and that this was part of it, what enabled him to then spiritually see. Um, well, actually, I don't know that he says specifically that it was the father, but he says God touched his eyes. Um, and then he says that Joseph pointed to his eyes as he made this statement. Um, so why would we trust John Alger's account? It's, it's a very late account. So first, the close connection with the Smiths, particularly through uh, Fanny Alger. Um, second, uh, John Alger recalled physical details relating to this telling, the, the pointing to the eyes. Uh, John Alger's account relating unique details of the first vision is something that we would expect when we realize that this account is actually the only account that we have of someone telling the first vision in the intimacy of a Smith family setting. This is at the Joseph Smith Senior Home. And the detail from John Alger's account matches a pattern of the, for the giving of physical and spiritual sight in the scriptures that involves the touching of the eyes. So let's look at that pattern. So first in the Bible, we have the first thing I would point to is not exact, but it's analogous. Isaiah's mouth was touched, and then he was able to speak prophetically with his mouth. That would be parallel to Joseph's eyes being touched, and therefore he can function as a seer. In the book of Abraham, Abraham 3, Abraham actually says the Lord placed his hand on his eyes, and then he could see the stars, uh, the worlds that God had created. Um, Jesus, in the Gospels, touches the eyes of the blind and heals them. Uh, Enoch in the book of Moses at God's command and acting therefore as God's proxy. Enoch uh, touches, well, I wrote that wrong, but he anoints his own eyes with clay 
which is what Jesus, how one of the ways that Jesus heals the blind, anointing their eyes with clay. Um, this one potentially takes a little more explanation, but I'm just going to sum it up. Um, in the story of the brother of Jared, of course, the Lord does not touch his eyes, uh, but the brother of Jared wants to be able to see, right? That's the issue, just like with the blind. And the Lord asks him, uh, what is it you would that I should do for you? And what he wants is for the Lord to touch these stones so that they can see. And then the Lord also gives him uh, with those two other stones um, that he has touched that um, are the interpreters that enable the brother of Jared to act as a seer uh, and others do, later to act as seers with these interpreters. Um, so that question, it's been pointed out before, um, that question that the Lord asked the brother of Jared, what is it you would that I should do for you, happens to be the very question that Jesus asks the blind in the Synoptic Gospels, and then they say, Lord, that we might see, and he touches their eyes so they can see. So there is a uh, scriptural theme of the, the sanctifying uh, by touching uh, particularly, uh, or the opening of the eyes of the physically or spiritually blind by the touching of the eyes. Uh, the first vision, I will also argue, did not occur all in the grove. It involved a heavenly ascent, which I will return to this idea later, but that was a kind of lifting up then, or exaltation, which is what, which means lifting up. Um, so as an analogy first, let's look at Lehi's calling theophany right at the very beginning of the Book of Mormon. Um, so first, the first part of this experience is that God's presence descends to earth in a pillar of fire. A pillar of fire comes and rests before Lehi. Then part two of his calling theophany is Lehi is taken up into heaven where he sees God on his throne. So the divine presence comes down to the person, then God lifts the person up to where God is in heaven. This, I'm arguing, is what happens with Joseph Smith. That's Lehi's first vision. This also, I'm arguing, is what happens in Joseph Smith's first vision. So Joseph Smith's first vision begins on earth. In his 1832 account, he writes that a pillar of fire descended, and he changes that crosses out fire later and makes it light, which is more familiar to us. It says that the, this pillar of fire did not burn the trees. So he's still seeing the, the grove uh, at the beginning of the experience. So God comes into the grove. The experience is located on earth. Then I would argue it moves to heaven. So we have a few indications pointing this way. So in uh, the 1844, to Wentworth letter, Joseph reports, my mind was taken away from the objects with which I was surrounded and I was enwrapped in a heavenly vision. It doesn't sound like he's just there necessarily just sitting in the grove. Uh, in the conclusion to his official uh, Joseph Smith history account, he also suggests that at some point during the experience he left the ordinary consciousness of his surroundings. He says, when I came to myself again, I found myself lying on my back, looking up into heaven. So his mind is taken away from his natural surroundings, and then he has to come to himself again and sort of find himself lying there in the grove. Uh, those details are similar to the heavenly ascent portion of Lehi's theophany, which we just discussed, in which he was overcome by the spirit and carried away in a vision. Joseph hinted at this heavenly ascent aspect of his first vision in a Nauvoo sermon. On June 11, 1843, uh, Joseph talked about how he had prayed about which of all the sects were right. He went into a grove and inquired of the Lord. Right? Um, I won't read all that right now. Um, in the um, same sermon, Joseph is talking about the members of the Godhead and he says, if they were to be stuffed into one person, that would make a great God. If I were to testify, he's, he's mocking the idea that the persons of the Godhood could all be one person. 
If I were to testify that the world was wrong on this point, it would be true. Peter says that Jesus Christ sat on the right hand of God. So note here the uh, parallel with uh, Joseph Smith's own experience where he sees the Father and on his right hand the Son. Um, any person that has seen the heavens opened knows that there's three personages in the heavens holding the keys of power. So what I find interesting here is that in this sermon, Joseph is talking about his own first vision experience and some of its implications for understanding that the persons of the Godhead are not just one person. Uh, they're separate as he'd seen the Father and the Son being. And then he throws in Anybody who's seen the heavens open knows this, right? Um, well, why does, he, why does he drop in something about seeing into the heavens when he's talking, been talking about the first vision? I'm going to suggest that in line with these other evidences, what Joseph is hinting at here is that he, as part of the first vision, had a heavenly ascent like Lehi. Um, the first vision led to Joseph Smith locating his white seer stone. So this is, again, part of this endowment theme. Um, so we have an account. It's from the uh, Joseph Smith's 1826 hearing for glass looking. He's charged with glass looking. Um, he said that he was, he was telling how he came to find his first seer stone. And he goes and he looks actually in someone else's he knew someone else who had a seer stone. He looks in her stone, and he was greatly surprised to see but one thing, which was a small stone a great way off. It soon became luminous and dazzled his eyes, and after a short time, it became as intense as the midday sun. Does that sound familiar? I mean, he sees a light, and then it grows brighter and brighter till it's as bright as the noonday sun. This is uh, in the wake of Joseph's first vision, this kind of similar experience would surely have echoed. If, if I can catch the connection there, he would have, right? <laughs> um, so uh, after having had his eyes touched, having seen his first vision, having become a seer, he's then being led to his first seer stone, his white stone. What is the significance of a white stone? Well, in the book of Revelation, it says that to him that overcometh, uh, dot, 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 I will give him a white stone, and in the stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving him that he that receiveth it. Wink, wink. Um, significance of a white stone. Also, Joseph talks about in 1843, it's in the Doctrine and Covenants, in DNC 130, uh, says that the white stone mentioned in Revelation 2.17, um, is given to those who come to the celestial kingdom where on a new name is written which no man knoweth save he that receiveth it the new name is the key word Joseph received his white stone in the wake of the first vision in this process of being initiated as a seer where his eyes are touched so that he can see and then he's given the stone that's connected with the new name and so on and, and revelation of higher truths that he can't just go out and share willy-nilly there's an endowment theme here. Um, through the first vision, Joseph acquired a divine attribute. But Joseph Smith goes into the first vision seeking wisdom, he says. Uh, wisdom, that's, he's seeking, partly seeking information, right? He wants to know which church is true. But wisdom is more than just, just information. Wisdom is also a divine attribute. To have wisdom in this sense would be to see as God sees and understand as God understands. So to become a seer was to acquire a divine attribute. In having his eyes touched by an all-wise, all-seeing God, Joseph Smith received divine sight, divine wisdom. Um, to use maybe a word that gets across the idea, even though it's not the best word, like um, being all-seeing is kind of contagious here, right? Like, if God touches you, if an all-seeing God touches your eyes, you see everything. Um, Joseph reports as much, actually, in describing finding his white stone. This is, again, from uh, the account of his 1826 hearing. Joseph says that after, when he travels, and it's a big story that I won't go into, uh, where he travels over by Lake Erie, and I've tried to find the place where this happened, by the way. Um, 
Uh, Joseph uh, digs up this white stone from under a tree, uh, placed it in his hat, and discovered that time, place, and distance were annihilated, that all intervening obstacles were removed, and that he possessed one of the attributes of deity, an all-seeing eye. So, of course, all-seeing eye, we've got that as um, temple symbolism. Um, and, of course, this is one of the attributes of deity. So, um, Joseph's first vision also anticipates exaltation itself. So, two scriptural terms for being taken up to God that the Book of Mormon talks a lot about being lifted up at the last day. Now, to be, the, the word exalted is so familiar to us in a certain context, meaning becoming like God, deification, we might say, um, that we don't necessarily think about what does the word literally mean? Like, and why, why was this term chosen to mean this? It, it means to be lifted up, right? Jesus says everyone who uh, exalts himself will be abased. Everyone who abases himself will be exalted. In the first vision, Joseph, uh, God descended to Joseph to, to the grove, right? To lift him up, that is to exalt him and to begin granting him divine attributes, beginning with wisdom. So the first vision was an endowment. The first vision was also an epitome and a concrete manifestation of the gospel of Jesus Christ. So what is the gospel? Um, in section 76, it says that, it's, that uh, he came into the world, even Jesus, to be crucified for the world, and to bear the sins of the world, save us. Um, third Nephi, Jesus says that he came into the world to do the will of the Father because the Father sent him so that he could be lifted up on the cross to draw all men to him so that as I have been lifted up by men, even so should men be lifted up by the Father. So the gospel is sent by the Father, God the Son, came into the world to bear our burdens and to be lifted up for us, to lift us up to him. Uh, this, is, this idea is also in Philippians, where Jesus was in the form of God, uh, pre-mortally, he was equal with God, but he empties himself, he takes on our likeness, and he dies on the cross so that he is then exalted by the Father so he can bring us up to be exalted with him. So the gospel, there was an early Christian formula summing up this idea, something that would be very familiar and resonant for Latter-day Saints. Uh, God became man in order that man might become God. So in Joseph Smith's first vision, there's an encapsulation of the gospel. In Joseph Smith's experience, God came down to earth to take Joseph up to heaven. God came down to his level in order to lift him up to God's level. This wasn't just an experience that taught the gospel. This was an experience of the gospel. The first vision presents the gospel, in fact, in its fullness. So um, what I mean by this is uh, Justice Smith's first vision is not just about, you know, um, God comes down and, you know, Christ, in Christ, and uh, Christ suffers for us so that we can, most of us maybe, be thrown into flames forever, you know, and then, like some of us, just become angels and are just sort of happy singing or whatever we're doing uh, for all time. Um, instead, this is from the very beginning of the Restoration, from the first vision, we see the gospel in its fullness, a gospel in which God reaches down to invite us to join him in his life. So, beginning to see the complexity, sweep, and power of Joseph Smith's first vision was the beginning of my return to the church. I had assumed that Joseph Smith had crafted the first vision as a young man, as a teenager, 
and I had assumed that he didn't know anything about the endowment as he would institute in Nauvoo until he was initiated as a Freemason in March 1842. Suddenly, as these things started to come together for me, neither of those views made the slightest bit of sense anymore. What kid, think about this, when he's 14 years old, says, you know what I'm gonna do? So I'm gonna make up a religion, and like, I'm gonna make up this vision that maybe like, I don't know, 20 years from now, I'm gonna institute a ritual based on. Nobody thinks like that, you know? Like, and so I was, for a variety of reasons, I was baffled by what I was starting to see. And then the model that I had of Justice Smith at the time was an opportunist, was, was that he was an opportunist. But as I started to see the real implications of the experience that he was relating, and the depth of understanding that it gave of the gospel and what Christ coming was all about, that became incredible to me that someone could have made this up and yet it has such complexity and depth and power that resonated for me and taught me things spiritually. So, um, Something that um, I, I just no opportunist came up with a spiritual experience that epitomizes, like no other, the gospel of Jesus Christ. Didn't happen um, that this was made up. I see something now that I still didn't see at that point. This was uh, nine years ago. Something that means a great deal to me, and that's the answer to another question. And that question is, what does all this mean for me? Like. Does this have something to do with how I should live my life right now? And if so, what? And um, to answer that, let's take one more dive into scripture. So in, um, I was reading Alma 7 a couple years ago with my good friend Joe Spencer in a scripture study. And some things really stood out to me there that as Alma was talking about Christ he talked repeatedly about how Christ would take upon him different things, our pains and sicknesses, take upon him death, take upon him our infirmities, uh, our sins. And I was struck by this phrase, take upon him death. When have you ever, we've all known lots of people who've died. When have you ever known someone to say, oh, that person took upon them death? Or, you know, someday by the natural course of things, I'll die. And are people going to say, oh, Don Bradley, he took upon him death? Nobody's going to say that because I'm not going to take upon me death. Death's going to take me upon itself, right? Like, I, uh, I am, like uh, King Benjamin says of himself, he's subject to all manner of infirmities, right? As human beings, as mortals, we're subject to infirmities. We're subject to death, right? So Christ what it's indicating here was not subject to infirmities. He was not subject to sin. He was not subject to death. He didn't have to suffer those things. He took those things upon himself voluntarily for our sake. So when, um, what does that pattern then have to do with how we should live our lives as disciples of Jesus Christ? If we look at the covenant that the Nephite disciples made when they first entered the church, when they were baptized, in Mosiah 18, it indicates that we are to bear one another's burdens. Alma asks his people, if, they, if, you're, willing, if you're willing to bear one another's burdens that they may be light, to mourn with those that mourn, to comfort those that stand in need of comfort, then come and be baptized. It's not enough to bear our own burdens. We are, by nature, subject to burdens. But what we're being asked to do is not just to bear the burdens that we don't have any choice but to bear in the first place. We're asked to follow the example of our Redeemer in taking upon us the burdens of others. That's exactly what he did. That's what he did for us. And so, um, Joseph Smith's 
first vision presents, along with um, Alma 7 and other passages that teach about the gospel, it presents this pattern, right? God in Christ has taken our burdens upon himself to lift us up to his level. This is what we are supposed to do for our fellow beings. Um, Joseph Smith's first vision is perhaps the paramount example of what the gospel of Jesus Christ can look like in human life. In the first vision, we see what the gospel is and what the gospel does. If you want to see what the gospel of Jesus Christ looks like in action, this is it. The gospel of Jesus Christ is that God loves us so much that in Christ, he comes down to meet us where we are, to lift us up to where he is, and that, as he did for Joseph Smith, sorry, the gospel is that, as he did for Joseph Smith in the first vision, he loves you and me so much that he would do that for you individually as he came down for Joseph Smith. Um, I have not seen a vision like Joseph Smith's. Uh, I suspect you haven't either. But I have tasted of the love of God. And I can testify to you that we are loved with a love that we cannot even imagine on our own. That we're loved with a love of which the greatest human love that we can experience is only a glimpse. In his first vision, Joseph Smith had what may be the single greatest revelation ever to a mortal human being. He would spend the rest of his life witnessing of it. As an historian of religion and a disciple of Jesus Christ, I had my witness to his. I know of no single experience in which the gospel of Jesus Christ has more fully performed its redeeming work of love or in which it is more fully epitomized than Joseph Smith's first vision. Thank you. read this without my Urim and Thummim? Oh, it's a question about the Urim and Thummim. Um, relationship of something to Urim and Thummim? Well, white stone. Um, yeah, I mean, it was similar in function. The, the, whites, the Urim and Thummim is actually just a pair of seer stones. Um, so. Where does Joseph Smith's desire for repentance fit in your discussion. Um, yeah, I mean, Joseph Smith talks about wanting to um, experience a forgiveness of his sins. That's part of why he goes to the grove. And um, I mean, I see that fitting really well into um, what I'm seeing here is that the first vision is not just a, like, a revelation about the fact that, okay, someday the church is going to be restored. It has a much more personal and redemptive significance. Um, an earlier question asked if people could get a copy of the quotes from here. I mean, I think that there will be a transcript made of this. Um, what uh, did you know about the first vision when you left the church? I mean, probably more than most people. Um, I don't know. I. Uh, had done a fair amount of research on it. It was a topic that was of great interest. I didn't, I had seen the first vision at that point more as just kind of a revelation about the restoration of the church, which like I said, it, it was, but that's just one part of what it was. Um. Mm. 
Mm. Oh, that's too far off topic. Um, <laughs> no. Not that we can announce. <laughs> What do you think of the idea that psilocybin mushrooms played a role in Joseph Smith's experiences? Well, I think that um, I know that there is a paper that's being written on that um, that's going to be published, so somebody else can handle that. Um, let's see, symbolism or thoughts on two stones? Oh, interesting. Uh, symbolism or thoughts on two stones, Urim and Thummim, and two human eyes versus one Justice White Seer Stone and Joseph and God's All Seeing Eye. Um, interesting. Um, <laughs> is the anticipated. Uh, most anticipated. Is the most anticipated book in church history on the, lost, on the 116 pages now out for sale finally? Um, it's uh, hopefully still going to be on sale. Um, my uh, publisher's back here, the publisher rep, Lloyd. Um, we are working on having that out still this fall. It's, there's still some stuff to be done, uh, but we are doing it. So it should be out soon, and hopefully it will be out this fall. Um, can you present your it'll, it'll be in the slides? Sometimes. Yeah. So. Um, just another question about the quotes. Okay. Thank you Thanks. so much. Really appreciate it. <laughs>